like to welcome everyone to our uh, First Survivorship Wellness uh, Lecture Series for this year. I'm Sharon Manny, I'm co-director of the Cancer Survivorship and Outcomes Center, and I'm really grateful that everyone is able to come today. Um, next slide, please. Our first speaker is Vivian's our first speaker is Monica Gillies, who is a clinical care coordinator, tobacco cessation counselor, and a tobacco treatment specialist at the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. And we're really happy to have her here today to talk about tobacco cessation and the effects of tobacco and cancer survivorship. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about tobacco treatment, the impact on cancer survivorship. Next slide. So everyone, please keep your microphones muted during the presentation. Please type any questions you may have in the chat box during the presentation. And of course, we'll have time after for questions. Next slide. So for today's agenda, we're talking about the benefits of tobacco cessation during cancer treatment. Why is smoking cessation so important among cancer patients and survivorship? How does smoking affect the immune system? What role does nicotine play in smoking? We'll look at workflow. How are patients, how are patients referred for evidence-based smoking cessation services? And we'll discuss some New Jersey, New Jersey resources for tobacco cessation. Next slide. We're talking about why smoking cessation is important among cancer patients. Persistent smoking has a negative effect on the immune system. It increases the risk of surgery complications and decreases the efficacy of radiation and chemotherapy. One of the immediate benefits from quitting smoking would be decreased inflammation Inflammation is linked to the risk of progression of many diseases, including cancer. The 69 of the 7,000 chemicals found in cigarettes are known to promote tumor growth and progression in all cancers. Another system that's improved immediately when quitting smoking is wound healing, and we'll talk about that as we go through the presentation. How tobacco causes disease. The damage is immediate. However, smokers are giving them the poisons in such small doses, they may not have a physical feel of what's happening. The poisons in smoke pose a danger right away. You can, you can have sudden blood clots, heart attacks, and strokes can be triggered by tobacco smoke. Poisons in tobacco smoke disrupt the way your body heals itself. Even smoking a cigarette now and then is enough to hurt you. Sitting in a smoky bar like years ago raises your odds of a heart attack. 30% of individuals who have heart attacks may be from secondhand smoke. Smoking longer means more damage. The more years you smoke, the more you hurt your body. Smoking keeps your body under attack. If you give yourself a visual of you spilling drain cleaner onto your skin and that skin becomes red and inflamed and that skin should be on its way to healing, but you immediately spill the drain cleaner on that skin again, that skin remains raw and red. That's what's happening to your wound healing capabilities. You're diminishing it. You stay red, irritated, and inflamed. The organs in your body also have a lining of the cells similar to skin. Chemicals in tobacco smoke cause inflammation and damage to these cells. When you keep smoking, the damage cannot heal. Smoking makes your immune system work over time. Your body makes white blood cells to respond to injuries, infections, and even cancers. And I want you to remember this as we talk about more in the presentation. Blood tests show that your white blood cell numbers stay high when you smoke. High numbers mean that your body is constantly fight, fighting against the damage caused by tobacco smoke. Next slide. We discussed the immune system. Just picture your immune system as the body's ultimate defense. When something that does not belong there, invaders come into contact, your immune system automatically 
comes into play to block the invaders from penetrating your system. Smoking makes your immune system work over time. Your body makes white blood cells to respond to injuries and infections. We talked about this in a previous slide that blood tests showed that your white blood cell numbers stay high even when you smoke. The constant stress disrupts how your body works. New research shows that stress can lead to disease in almost any part of your body. Next slide. Effects of smoking on cancer. About one third of smokers who are diagnosed with cancer continue to smoke. And we'll talk about this when we understand what role nicotine plays. So when you see numbers as one third of smokers are still smoking, it's not that they didn't understand the consequence of their diagnosis and what smoking was doing, but there's a whole component as to why they weren't able to just stop. 40 to 60% of lung and, head, lung and head and neck cancer patients are smokers. 40 to 50% of them continue to smoke even after their diagnosis. There's a 50% increase in all-cause mortality of cancer patients who smoke. 61 increase in the relative risk of cancer-specific mortality. Next slide. Impact on cancer treatment. In addition to death, patients with cancer who continue to smoke have a 42% higher reoccurrence of a primary disease. That patient may have been diagnosed with whatever disease, whatever cancer the physician presents to them. They're going through courses of treatment. However, that primary disease that we think we're treating, if a patient is still smoking, the reoccurrence is 42% higher, two times higher rates of subsequent primary malignancy. Your cancer originated in one area, and we're not talking about metastasism, we're talking about developing a whole new cancer in another area of your body. High rates of morbidity, meaning more cancer-related pain, lower performance status, higher treatment-related toxicity, which would be wound healing delay, pulmonary complications, and infection. Next slide. Cancer treatment risk of continued smoking. Reduce effectiveness of cancer treatment in patients who continue to smoke. Specifically lung cancer, there are poor sur uh, surgical outcomes, lower survival, more metastasis, subsequent malignancies, and worse symptoms. Head and neck cancer, there's a 1% decrease in progression-free survival per pack year. Next slide. And these are just preoperative risk of smoking. We look at the odds ratio, and this is for everyone, but now you're including these complications for someone that's still smoking. You have the general morbidity, you have wound complications, general infection, pulmonary complications, neurological complications, and admissions to ICU. You have patients that may have had a surgical procedure and had to be perhaps mechanically ventilated for that procedure. And normally after surgery, they're able to come off the mechanical uh, ventilation and start to recover. But due to preoperative risk of smoking, that person that should have been removed from the ventilator now be, may become an admission to an ICU due to smoking. Next slide. We discussed that smoking can cause cancer almost anywhere in your body. We usually talk about the most prevalent areas. We hear about lung cancer, heart disease, with smoking. However, as you can see, this system goes through every part of you where you can see mouth and throat, your voice box, which is your larynx, your esophagus, where you have esophageal cancers, the oral cancers. Even fertility is something that is affected from smoking. And that way we talk about HPV and someone developing cancer, uter uh, cervical cancer, and then we have prostate cancer. So cancer is, is anywhere in your body, and of course, smoking can only exacerbate it. We have liver, stomach, pancreas. You have colon and rectum. Next slide. We talked about the 69 chemicals that are known cancer causers, carcinogenics, but there are about 7,000 chemicals in the cigarettes. And these are a few that we're going to look at today. We have sulfuric acid. We have formaldehyde, which we know is used in embalming fluid. 
We have tar that we are seeing being used on the sides of the roads for roads repairs. We have ammonia, which is a popular cleaning agent. You have acetone, which is a product used to remove nail polish. You have carbon monoxide, which is a silent killer. All our homes should be equipped with carbon monoxide monitors. And you have arsenic, which is used in rat poison. And these are chemicals that are in the cigarettes that people are inhaling into their airways. Next slide. We discuss a little bit the number of chemicals in tobacco smoke. We see that there are 7,000 chemicals and hundreds are toxic. We know that 70 of them do cause cancer. And I wanna show you here, it's not just combustible smoke. Evidence will show that the electronic cigarettes, the vaping products, as you can see, there's a USB port that's actually one of the pods, the vaping pods. And a lot of the uh, tobacco companies have transitioned from regular tobaccos to the e-cigarette market, and they've designed them to look like regular everyday things. One looks like a pen, one looks like a flashlight. So these are the chemicals that people are inhaling unknowingly. Next slide. Then we have some other illustrations here of what the vaping products look like. You'll see the bottles with the fluid are the different flavors that are provided for e-cigarette users. And you can see some of the flavors that are displayed would be a cherry, raspberry, uh, black blackberry, blueberry. And again, you see how the cigarettes in one hand and the e and the e pen or the vaping pen in one hand, so that one vaping pen could be equivalent to one pack of cigarettes or more, depending on how much fluid is being used. Next slide. And when we talk about cancer, survivorship, smoking, and we saw that one third of smokers after being diagnosed with cancer continue to smoke. And there's a reason that they don't just stop after being told that they have cancer. Nicotine is one of the five most addictive drugs, and it falls into the category of cocaine, heroin, alcohol, and methamphetamines. What the nicotine does is that within taking a few puffs, within eight seconds, the nicotine hits the receptors in your brain that lights your brain up like the 4th of July fireworks, that dopamine is activated. And that's that feel good hormone. And that, that's exactly why people smoke. The only other thing that can give you such a quick reaction would be an IV. Everything else that you take has to go through your digestive system. Whereas you're inhaling nicotine through vaping or combustible tobacco, such as cigarettes or cigars, you get it within eight seconds to your brain. And that's why the addiction is so much of a hold on individuals that are still smoking, even after a cancer diagnosis. Next slide. And we talk about why someone with cancer is still smoking. You have very powerful marketing strategies. And of course, it's not just cancer, but we know a lot of the diseases will lead to cancer if not treated. We have cigarette manufacturers attached filters to the butts under the guise of filtering out the large amounts of tar that can be ingested. When we looked at one of the previous slides and we saw that tar was one of the key chemicals that make up the cigarettes, you look here at the filter, which is a clear filter, and a filter is supposed to have, have smokers think that they're not ingesting all those properties that they're inhaling. And as you can see from this photograph here, the filter does nothing to stop the tar from getting through. The yellow discoloration of the filter was only invented to reassure smokers that tar was being collected. So if the manufacturers could have gotten away with keeping the filters clear, they would have. All they wanted to do was just give a false sense of security to smokers. The color change that you see was only due to the change in the pH, not because it was actually trapping the chemicals. Cigarette filters are composed of cellulose paper, plastic, 
amongst other chemicals. Glue was added in the 1950s to make cigarettes seem safer. Some of the first filters contained asbestos and tobacco companies were aware from their own research that the filter, filters do almost nothing to reduce danger. And also I wanna point out that it's early as the 19, as early as the 1960s, I would say 1964, that the tobacco companies knew that there was a, a Surgeon General report that first talked about a link of cancer and smoking and nothing was done about it. Next slide. Now, the, care, the cost of cancer treatment alone is one thing in the United States, but the slide that you're looking at is per smoking cancer patient. So we know cancer costs the states that we live in, the whole country, quite a bit of money, but this is only for per smoking cancer patient. It is $10,678 per smoking cancer patient to receive treatment. That's $3.4 billion in the United States for all smoking cancer patients. Next slide. Now the rationale for screening and treating tobacco dependence in a cancer care setting. We talked about how important it is. We know that the immune system is under attack. We know that there's increased uh, morbidity and mortality when you're still smoking. But we need to be able to screen our patients because we have many patients coming through the different clinics, the different hospitals. And if we're not looking into their smoking status while they're receiving treatment, it's really um, a fighting battle if we don't monitor a patient's smoking status. Persistent smoking is a modifiable risk factor associated with morbidity and mortality in cancer care. Persistent smoking, as we talked about, is associated with increased risk of reoccurrence, second primary cancers, treatment complications, and poor treatment response. We know poor treatment drug interactions and other tobacco-related medical conditions. There's diminished quality of life and reduced survival. And when we talk about survivorship, is that we want to make sure that when someone has gone through a successful regimen of cancer treatment, that they stay on a path for healing and to be cancer-free. But that definitely will be diminished if someone is still smoking. We use evidence-based clinical guidelines that exist for effective, effectively treating tobacco dependence. Cancer patients use evidence-based cessation treatment is low. And what we'll talk about is how we can address this in different institutions. So I'll say that one more time. Cancer patients' use of evidence-based cessation treatment is low and oncology providers miss many opportunities to advise cessation and treatment tobacco dependence. Next slide. What the recommendations are is that smoking cessation should be offered as an integral part of oncology treatment and continue throughout the entire oncology care continuum. Smoking status should be documented and updated in the electronic medical medication record and most effective treatment is combined with pharmacological and behavioral therapy. There was a survey that 92% of oncologists said they would absolutely recommend tobacco cessation treatment to their patients. When they took the survey and they saw the results, only 62% referred their patients to smoking cessation treatment. Next slide. With the components of, of oncology care, we always hear of radiation, surgery, and chemotherapy. Those are the three pillars that are most noted for cancer regimen. However, survivorship and the knowledge of understanding that cancer and smoking is something we need to really tackle is that we wanna make tobacco cessation the fourth pillar of cancer care. Smoking cessation is designated as the fourth pillar of cancer care in addition to the three components that everyone is familiar with. Next slide. When we talk about smoking cessation, it's simply the process of quitting smoking. 
Smoking is extremely dangerous as we discussed with the different chemicals. It's uh, dangerous to individuals' health. Cigarette contains substance that call, that's called nicotine, which we said is highly addictive and causes dependence. Stopping successfully to quit can be a goal that is very difficult to achieve. Next slide. What we want to do when someone is presented with a cancer diagnosis or going through cancer treatment, we want to make sure that we have checked their smoking status and they are referred to a program. And what you want to discuss with the patient is to set a quit date. And we encourage the patient to tell their friends and their families, even coworkers, that they plan to quit. So they have a support system and sometimes someone to be accountable to. We explained that you want to anticipate for change. It will be challenging, but you'll be able to face it better while you quit when you have these support systems in place. You want to remove cigarettes and other tobacco products from your home and car and work where it may be more prevalent to smoke. Of course, work has been very challenging. Depending on where you work, there's still opportunities that people walk off campus or walk down the street and they can still actually go for a cigarette break. And definitely, you always want to discuss with your physician or other healthcare uh, clinicians with the care team about getting help to quit. Next slide. This is an example of a workflow for someone that is will be receiving cancer treatment and tobacco cessation. So what we would like is that all cancer patients should be screened and rescreened for tobacco use. Smoking cessation improves cancer treatment outcomes, and there's data that supports that recent tobacco cessation prior to a cancer diagnosis improves survival. This is myself working in the uh, CINJ clinic. If I have a patient that has been identified that is a current smoker, I would get a referral and I would reach out to the patient. As you saw in the previous slide, we talked about planning a quit date, speaking to the family members um, to get that support system and offer the tobacco cessation. Either telehealth counseling can be in person, it could be group or individual. And you want to discuss the, uh, the cessation medications that have been FDA approved. Next slide. As a tobacco treatment specialist, you want to provide supportive, evidence-based, standardized tobacco dependence treatment. You have a shared decision-making with the patient that we will come up with a plan that you feel will work better for you, and I'm here to guide you through that plan. I will help you choose a quit date. It could be something special coming up if you're not ready to quit right away. We have the holidays. We know that January 1st is a day that most people dedicate to re-energizing re when it comes to diets, just starting anew, or it could be a birthday or anniversary. So we'll try to come up with that together. As we've discussed, the counseling is available as a tobacco treatment specialist, you are monitored and evaluated for your individual progress. And even there's relapse prevention, because we know when someone is smoking, there's a prevalence to relapse. And we say it may happen, but we want you to continue on the path of remembering that you're doing something for your overall survival. We do follow-up and we also provide ongoing support. Next slide. There are seven FDA approved medications. Two are oral medications that are from pres by prescription only. The typical um, nicotine replacements that you may be familiar with or have heard of are the nicotine patches, the gum, the lozenges, there's nicotine nasal spray and inhalers. There's varenicline, which is also called Chantex, which is the brand name, and then there's a uh, Zyban or Wellbutrin that can be prescribed to help with smoking cessation. Next slide. Now we encourage people to understand that when you do stop to smoke, you're actually, surprisingly, some people don't believe this, but if we were to take your blood pressure or just take your vitals 20 minutes after you stop smoking, you'd be surprised to see what those numbers look like when you first came in. 
If I did your vitals when you first come in and 20 minutes later after not smoking, we take your vitals again, you'll notice that your blood pressure and your heart rate is more normal. And we can even look at this through 12 hours later. We can look at this a few months later. You can see all these things a bit later on so we can see how you're being monitored. Uh, next slide. In the state of New Jersey, we have some quit center resources for anyone that may not have gone through the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. You could be going through another area of the Barnabas Health System, and they decided to give you these quit centers. We have them through every county in the state of New Jersey with the different quit lines, and all these services are provided either uh, in person or you can do this via telehealth. Uh, next slide. Yes. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please let me know. There was a question about um, relapse, and I would be interested in hearing the rates of relapse, your approach to relapse. Um, sure. We would say about Relapse, it could be anywhere from 30% of individuals that do relapse. And when we say relapse, it doesn't mean they're all full on blown smoking again. It could be someone that decided for smoking cessation and they may have slipped and had two cigarettes that day where like previous few days they had no cigarettes. So it happens and all we do is say, we start again the next day and we just get back on track and start again because the addiction component will take a, a, a little bit to work through. And that's why we talked about how addictive nicotine is. There was a second question. Oh, how much vaping is equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes? Yeah, I would be really interested in do okay. cancer survivors vape or use e-cigarettes? I mean, what is the, the sort of pathway that people use if they're not going to use cigarettes anymore. Now, vaping or e-cigarettes, when it was first introduced on the market, was supposed to be a weaning tool. So you may have physicians with different schools of thought that would rather you vape than smoke if it is used properly. So again, I must stress that there are chemicals that have been found in vaping um, aerosol. However, if it's used properly by adults, we're talking about adults now, not the epidemic of uh, middle schoolers and adolescents. But if an adult is vaping, it is something that a physician would rather you do than combustible cigarettes. I give you an example. One pack of cigarettes is 20 cigarettes in a pack. There are some vaping pods, like we saw in the um, previous slides, they look like USB ports. Some of those pods are equivalent to two packs of cigarettes. So even though someone is not lighting up and it's not combustible, you may be exposing yourself to double the amount of chemicals that are in the vaping products because they're still not FDA regulated. They have been a real strong push to get them FDA regulated over the summer. And Juul was one that was, we thought about to be FDA regulated, but they put a hold on it. So until we really know what's in the vaping products, that's why you know I have to really be careful how I'm promoting, not promoting vaping compared to combustible tobacco. Can you talk a little bit about sort of um, the pathways that you use for people who are trying different methods of cessation? If you switch, if something isn't working, do you use two things? Just sort of the combination approaches that you might use with the cancer survivor. Yes. Yeah, so with the cancer survivors, we look at smoking history also. If you have someone that has been smoking for 30 years compared to someone that may have been smoking to five years, so that person's addiction may be a lot greater. So what we'll do is do a full assessment, and the assessment can take anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. You get smoking history, you get social history, 
and you look at their habits. Like when someone wakes up in the morning, if they need to grab a cigarette within the first five minutes of waking up, you know that person is highly addicted. So you may want to look at the different milligrams. There's different strengths of the nicotine replacement. We start at, um, there can be anywhere from 21 milligrams being the highest, 14 is middle range, 14 milligrams or seven milligrams is a light smoker. And based on that assessment, you would know where that patient patient would need to go. So in addition to your long acting nicotine replacement, which would be a patch, you also use in conjunction the short acting nicotine replacement, which would be your gum or your lozenges. So for instance, if I have a, someone that's smoking about a pack a day, which is 20 cigarettes a day, that person can literally have, instead of smoking, 20 pieces of gum or lozenges uh, you know, uh, alternating between them. You can have up to 20 pieces a day. So if someone is a 20 day, a 20 cigarette a day smoker, and they say to me, the first thing I usually do is within five minutes is want to smoke. You want to make sure that person has a patch on from the evening before that they slept with it. So the nicotine could be uh, a little bit less in their system as they're waking up. So then that that, that short acting gum, they would pop in before really the craving hits. So we rather use your nicotine replacement, then grab a cigarette. And of course, with the tobacco cessation um, program, the tobacco treatment specialist helps you to understand your triggers, helps you to cope with um, being able to give yourself a five minute break that usually cravings will go away within five minutes or so. And we show you those the components of how to regulate those cravings a lot better. The first one to three weeks are the hardest. So we say, be patient with yourself. Can you talk a little bit about the issue of stigma? I do think that a lot of people that are lung cancer patients, um, especially you know who have been smoking a lot, do get a fair amount of sort of, well, that's what caused your cancer. It's the first thing that people ask, of course, if you have lung cancer, is did you smoke? Um, and how you work with patients who have continued to smoke, because if they're continuing to smoke after treatment, we know that they're more addicted. Right. And so I'm just wondering how you would, how you like deal with it, because there's some special issues with cancer survivors versus non-cancer survivors who smoke. Right. And as you know, I work specifically for CINJ. So all my patient referrals are all cancer patients. So when I do get a referral and I do know someone is still smoking, I actually have called patients to say, I received the referral and we wanted to talk to you about tobacco cessation. We know you have some therapies coming up and we want to make sure that they're the most effective for you and that the treatment that you are receiving will work. So when you speak to them that way, that gets them to understand that, okay, yes, I am smoking and I'm not constantly hitting you over your head about the smoking, but we're just talking about what the smoking is still doing while you're seeking treatment. So with that, you, you allow that person to be more of a captive audience to want to hear you opposed to me going into a critical conversation with them. They know what they're doing is wrong for them. They don't need me to tell them that, but it's just education and compassion. And I tell people there's not a person that wants to hurt themselves. There's not a cancer patient that's smoking that would not want to be smoke-free the next day if they could be. So that's where it's patience and time. And I explain to them, you've been smoking for a while. It's gonna take a while, but if you allow me to work with you and help you to cope and we'll get to a point where it's not gonna be overnight, this is a journey. I have someone that is still smoking, but they're not smoking 20 cigarettes a day anymore. They're down to 10. What I want to promote to say, oh, that's better than the pack because you are still exposing yourself to the toxins, but it is a step in the right direction. If they're a survivor, though, you know, if they're, if they're done with treatment, do you have, I mean, there, there is, I assume, evidence to suggest that if you continue to smoke after treatment, that there are some longer term, longer term um, issues that they may have. 
Absolutely. And we talked about the reoccurrence, that primary cancer that you, you were treated for, but yet, you know, treatment's been successful. You're doing well. We talked about the white blood cells, the labs, because all of these things are in conjunction, like it's the whole body that you're treating. So if you're getting blood work done and then the doctors are not starting to see that your labs don't look like they should, we look at the history. And that's why we talk about even in survivorship, you you want to make sure that you stay cancer free, and we and, and yeah, the risk for other cancers, I mean, remain right and cardiovascular it disease. Remains. It which might be worsened as well by chemo, or depending on the treatment. So there it, still is a motivation. It's never too late. It's to never stop too late. Or reduce your smoking. I have a ninety That's year it. old. I have a ninety year old that is receiving uh counseling as a survivor you can still have so many more years ahead of you. So that's why education is key and explaining to someone so they understand what it, not what they're giving up, it's what they're gaining. And then the quit centers. Did you want to talk a little bit about sort of the cost and you know where people can seek treatment if they're not a patient at the cancer center currently? And, and what's wonderful is that the cost centers that we displayed in New Jersey, they're free. They are absolutely free. You call, you get assessed by a tobacco treatment specialist, like we talked about. They'll do an assessment to see what type of smoking history you have. And from there, they will determine the best course of treatment, the nicotine replacement. If a prescription is needed, that part, then insurance would have to be um, then looked into. But in terms of calling the quit centers, and if the quit centers are treating someone adequately with just over-the-counter products, those over the um, counter products are free to the patient. Yeah. But you don't need your doctor to refer you with your offer. You, you, right? you can just you show know. up to a quit center. You have, when we do you table line. events. Even the quit line, it sounds like there's a phone number too. Yes, all the when we do tabling events, also in addition to me um, working at the Cancer Institute, I've done cable, uh, tabling events with community outreach. We were at Oktoberfest at Hamilton Park and I had a whole display and I've had, I, I actually had about 30 people that are current smokers that I, I said, all you need to do is call. And what I was also promoting was this Saturday is lung cancer screening. So they're coming to get screened and, you know, in the event that there are you know, deemed to have cancer, they absolutely are going to get screened and they will be receiving the nicotine replacement and tobacco cessation therapy. Does anybody else have any questions who's on the um, call today? I just want to really thank you for your time. It's really educational and really helpful. And I see that there's a lot of services available for the patients and survivors. So I'm just really pleased to to hear all about that. Um, just before we wrap up, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming and then to talk about the remaining part of our lecture series of uh, events coming up. In January, we have a really great talk about proper nutrition for cancer survivors. We have a talk by Joan Hogan, a social worker here at the Cancer Center on psychological distress and well being, which will be some experiential components, super interesting. Um, Angela Fong, a kinesiologist at our Cancer Center, we're talking about exercise and physical activity for cancer survivors. Katie Devine is an expert in young adults and adolescents, so she'll be talking a little bit about the unique psychosocial um, issues and the engagement in post-treatment care among these uh, patients who uh, transition to survivorship. And then our last talk will be Alyssa Barker, um, OTR, we're talking about how to manage lipidemia, which is a really common effect of some forms of cancer treatment. So I just wanted to thank everybody and, and just remind people that some of you will be getting a link um, and a little QR code to fill out a questionnaire. You'll also be mailed uh, resources that Monica has very nicely put together for you that we'll send you. And once you sign up, you'll be getting some other information from us about uh, wellness uh, resources in the future. So I just want to thank everybody for coming, I particularly thank Monica for the time that she spent with us today and hope everybody has a, a great night and thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bye everybody and thanks for coming.